and we're live. All right, so everyone's here for progressive decouple Drupal for everyone. Raise your hand. Excellent. The audience is very engaged. Thank you. So if I click next, that would help. Um, everyone on our side, we'll introduce ourselves as we go through. But I'm Brian Olendike, BTO Pro. Um, it's a joy to be joined by the panelists here today, sitting in the principal's office, as they said at the beginning, of uh, Becca Goodman, Michael Potter, and Charles Levera. We're going to talk to you about web components and progressive decoupling, why we didn't do full-on decoupled development, from very different perspectives. So, whoop, that's the agenda. <laughs> so, for our agenda, um, why progressive decoupling? Like, why did we not just go full-on decoupled with, like, a React or Gatsby? Um, Real-world implementations, we're going to talk about what web components are and why I think they need to be the future for everything, whether it's Drupal or otherwise. Uh, give you tools and links and buzzwords and hacks the web, and we'll explain what that is by the end. So my name is Brian Olendike. Uh, I am now a front-end developer at Penn State. I say now because I've been doing Drupal development for like 13 years, and I totally switched job roles at this event three years ago with that guy because he convinced me to adopt web components. So... Um, let's briefly look at some of the pros of decoupling. So it's future focused, right? We're gonna get to the future and you've got this headless system. It's just a nice API layer. Everything makes so much more sense this way. There's clearly defined job roles, right? So you have your backend development people, PHP, Drupal, whatever that is, and your JavaScript front end developer roles, CSS, that type of thing. Um, and then you can get off of Drupal theoretically at some later point in time, because you've got just an API layer, is the idea. Again, it just makes sense, TM. Um, so it also helps keep Drupal relevant, theoretically. But I really think that decoupled development is decoupled from reality. So um, it's expensive. It requires dedicated teams. I have yet to see a project pulled off successfully with it with a team of one or a shop of five. It's usually really big teams, really ambitious projects, really ambitious media experiences, which is totally fine, but don't try and push it on me, a team of like two that's borrowing resources from another group, so we have four, right? That's just not gonna happen. So um, I think medium to small sites aren't gonna care, and honestly, they're not gonna see a gain from it anyway. It's just gonna be like, your end user's gonna use the site, the end. Are um, you talking about decoupling existing sites or building something from scratch or both? Uh, kind of both, to be perfect. It's just, it's, I think it's very expensive. It has a much longer timeline uh, because you need to have these dedicated job roles, whereas Drupal being this panacea, I can kind of build a thing out of, out of thin air if I know the twig template layer even. So, um, and then timelines with a huh? So, um, also, what I think this is forgetting is that organizations have more than one project. They have lots of projects going on. I'm on the thing places where things get implemented. So if you implement a decoupled site for me, now I want the next decoupled site to have an identical information architecture. It's the same reason why we wanted to have all Drupal or all WordPress or whatever it is in our organization. Um, but I think you lend, it lends itself to Drupal versions becoming their own islands. So you end up with this WordPress, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Jekyll, they're not the same, and yet you end up having radically different ways in which those things are implemented. So, um, and honestly, a lot of people still can't upgrade from Drupal 8. It's an unfortunate reality, just look at the, the statistics. So, um, I'm in this boat too, I'm stuck on Drupal 7, you might know me from that project previously, and so the way we tried to get a little bit off of Drupal 7 was around uh, design systems, and so we had different CSS libraries in place, on top of other different CSS libraries that says. So we switched from Zerg Foundation to materialized CSS to Bootstrap at one point in a failed experiment. And now we've got CSS laying around and all these other Drupal modules mashed together, which made our, our front end very sad. So um, what Potter tried to do to fix this for us, and we presented DrupalCon Baltimore uh, in 2016, is, um, is the, sorry, 2017, is this, is, hey, we're gonna just do it headless, it's gonna be AngularJS, this is awesome. And he went for like eight minutes straight, just talking increasingly faster till people started to leave the room because they're like, I don't know what's going on. But the joke was that you couldn't possibly do it. Like at the end, he's like, and that's why we're never doing this again. And so skipping that talk entirely, I can tell you we went a different path than AngularJS, which we were messing around with at that time. So we are able to go this way while still supporting everything we used to do. So. Uh, we also created a brand new project in the process. So 
Everything you've ever heard us talk about before, if you've ever seen any of our talks, we still support all of that stuff and push forward into the new world with meager resources. And the reason and the way that we can do that is with a browser standard called Web Components. So Web Components are a four-part meta specification of the browser that you are using on your laptop or phone right now that basically gives you a component architecture system. So similar to what you're able to get with a React or Angular or Vue, can be done natively. You don't actually need those tools to get you the component aspect. So what this ends up looking like in practice is if you go to hackstheweb.org and you see the little Octocat or anything on this site, the site is illustrating hundreds of web components, you can click that and see that that's Octocat is a git corner tag. So we're allowed to define brand new valid HTML elements that can then rework on any website. So it's platform agnostic. So Imagine that your DOM is made up of all these other little bricks that you can generate, right? You all, we all have buttons, we all have sliders, and we have tabbed areas. What if instead of those being HTML and CSS, there were these brand new tags made up of all the stuff you wrote before? Now you're not tied to your Twig templates and your TPL files. So those work on any platform because of browser compatibility. So whether your next project is React, or whether it's Vue, or whether it's Drupal, or WordPress, or a static website, that stuff is still going to work. You can still have the same development workflow for generating the front end of that website. So you can go to webcomponents.org and you end up seeing this chart. It's all green all the way across, meaning that everything is supported natively. Um, and if you go to Can I Use, you should see like a global traffic score of 89% of browsing traffic is now native, no polyfills. Now, if you, if you lump polyfills in, you're gonna hit by my estimates, 98.3% of traffic, or 03. Um, that, to me, says if we have to hit that extra 2% globally, we're talking progressive enhancement strategies. Like this stuff is getting a wide enough swath that I should be able to hit about 90% of traffic. Again, holistic traffic. You might have different numbers. I have different numbers as far as browser support. But um, I think this is only gonna go further north because two things just happened. Windows 7 just died. <laughs> and IE11, if you may, you may not know this, but IE11 has kind of silently died as well, or will very soon. So Edgium, as people are calling it, this is the new version of Edge, which is Chromium-backed. However, built into that, as they move forward, there is no longer going to be an IE11 icon on the desktop. You won't even be able to run things in a compatibility mode. A system admin will have to say, this website requires IE11. So it's not going to happen you know, today or tomorrow. This just dropped like two weeks ago. But this is coming fast, and you're going to have to not worry about IE11. And part of this wave is just in who's adopting it. So I always get the question of like who's using web components. And usually the answer is Google. But here's a couple brands, ING Bank, BYU University, Red Hat, Salesforce, Apple, McDonald's, Amazon, Sakai Learning Management System, Comcast, Microsoft, Penn State, maybe you've heard of them too. Um, so a lot of people are using this. And I don't know why I said ING, or I don't think IGN is, isn't using this, but these are just illustrating that on any website, even if it's not using web components, these are now definitions. So Imagine that the button tag on your, your website actually has a definition in the browser that defines the button. So a web component boils down to basically be, here's a whole bunch of CSS, and you have a class-based element if you're not familiar with class-based JavaScript. So I have thing extends lit element. This is what makes up the corner, uh, that git corner. And so there's CSS in there, and then I've got HTML or other web components that I've made, because you can stack these things just like you can um, uh, traditional HTML, and then I can define some properties and attributes, right? Like, so a link tag is a href equals. Somewhere deep in the browser is something saying that an a tag has a href, right? No other tag responds to a, a href. So in the same way, I can add new tags, or sorry, new properties and attributes to these new tags that I made. And so then the last part is that you have to tell the browser the mapping between the two. So this is effectively window.customElements.define git corner equals this class. Meaning, hey front end, whenever you see a git hyphen corner tag, I need you to run it through this class. And then you need to teach the web page about that definition. So we have a new type of JavaScript tag that's script type module. And so you can modularly import JavaScript assets. So uh, how do I get started with this? That's like a whole conference of its own, but um, 
we're going to introduce you to someone who has gotten started with this on these two uh, applications here. So if you go to open-wc.org, it's a really good place to start. Very simple, easy to use tooling to make web components that work anywhere. And then if you go to lit-element.polymer-project.org slash try, is a very nice little five-page tutorial on how to get started with Lit Element. And oh. with that... Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Becca Goodman. Um, I am the branch chief at the National Archives. Um, maybe you've heard of us. We house federal records somewhat effectively um, on Twitter, one little Becca, um, etc. All the things. Okay, great. Um, so, to paint the scene, um, government websites are bloated, obviously, right? They have a lot of properties which have similar assets. Um, most agencies have uh, numerous numerous sites that they maintain, like we, we maintain over 400 sites and we have a team of three developers and five content people. Um, and our content people are wholly focused on like content interacting with, you know, the UI of Drupal and that kind of stuff as opposed to actually development, um, like back end, front end, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's another common theme in most agencies where it's minimal teams, minimal resources, minimal, like a small amount of, of funding, right? Because, you know, <laughs> we can't seem to get a budget. <laughs> So, you know, all the things. Um, and a lot of us are stuck on Drupal 7 or some other <laughs> variation thereof, just stuck in dark ages, right? So, um, <laughs> how do we de-bloat the government? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, Web Components provides a new way forward, and um, it, you can do it one piece at a time, which is super exciting. So, at least for us, and you can start super basically, which, again, is awesome. So, welcome to NARA where records are old, history is in your face, and websites are massive. Um, we are no different than the government. Our sites are extremely bloated, and the load times are challenging. I have an excellent lead developer who has done a very good job at minimizing it, but it is what it is. Um, they, our sites are all pretty much convoluted, and a good portion of them are pieced together as we added more and more content, online exhibits, um, and different areas to the site. So. How do we make the user experience amazing while still supplying billions of records? We literally have over a billion records in NARA in general and over a billion that are being worked towards digitizing. We've digitized a ton, but how do we display that and how can we utilize it in an effective manner where you're actually getting what you are searching for in a faster front end, right? So obviously, the answer is web components, right? <laughs> Duh. Okay. But for reals, web components do create a way forward, which is super exciting. So um, the million dollar question, how did we do it? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so first I had to start with convincing my bosses. Um, and the way that I did that was I outlined the benefits that, they, that would be appealing to them. So for example, um, we are undergoing a huge branding effort at NARA, and one of the good things about Web Components is that it allows you to build once and deploy everywhere, and if you make a change to that one component, it changes across the board without um, any kind of lift, really, which is amazing. Um, so pitching it in that manner, um, stating that it's platform agnostic, so it essentially allows us to move forward if we choose to move off of Drupal, which, I mean, if we're being honest, um, you know, like, at some point everybody will move off of Drupal, right? Because it just, things progress. So thinking long term, how can we do that in a, an effective way without losing a ton of um, work that we've already developed? Pitching that was an excellent um, topic to the technical side of our bosses, or my bosses, really. Um, Anyway, if you can't tell, I'm very nervous, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, also, it allowed us, it, it'll allow us to be more, more nimble. We're a small team, um, and due to web components and utilizing them, you can accelerate development and in turn save time and money. Saving money is like huge, right? Saving time on our developers because we maintain a ton of sites, and we're currently redesigning. We have three redesign projects going on right now, and our team is very small, as I mentioned. Our, dev team. Um, anyway, accessibility is also a huge selling point because um, we have high accessibility standards within the federal government. And um, a huge, huge selling point to um, my division director who basically makes decisions for the entire 
Office of Innovation um, was telling her that we'll be the first agency to do it, to use web components. No other agency in the government is using web components, and um, she was super excited about that, like jumped up and down, clapping, very exciting. Um, so, how did I convince my, my development team? This was a bigger challenge than convincing my bosses, believe it or not, um, because they're, you know, they're very inundated with um, developing the way that most Drupal developers are, right? Um, so I have two full stack devs and a front end guy, and he hates front end. He would rather just do user research all day, <laughs> which is fine, but um, doesn't necessarily help me a ton. So I had to really convince my, my dev team that this was the way to go. And um, I laugh at this because, like, this, like I said, it was harder. Um, but essentially, I was like, we need a better editing experience because we are currently turning over all of our editing to um, people outside of our office. Our, my content team is dissolving and getting moved elsewhere. And so um, we're not going to have that as an aspect anymore. So how can we make the editing experience better? And I gave them options. I was like, look, we, we, CK editor is not enough. Um, Gutenberg is there, paragraphs. Uh, and then there's this thing called hacks. Like, what, what do you guys want to use? Let's install them all in, in dev environments and test them out. What do you think? And um, my lead dev came back to me and outlined why he preferred hacks, which was because, like, with paragraphs and Gutenberg, when you're installing, like when you're adding more content and whatever and you're using Gutenberg, it'll add, on, add in unnecessary code to your content. And then when you get ready to migrate to anything aside from whatever platform you're on, it becomes an even bigger challenge because you have to remove that code from your content, which is super crappy. So um, Hacks doesn't actually add in any, any kind of extra anything to your content, which is beautiful, and everybody was super excited about that. Um, and my UX lead saw the potential of hacks, which led him to being tasked with the usability testing, testing for hacks to um, make it more friendly, and we will talk about that soon. Um, so, how did we start? Um, I convinced that guy over there, <laughs> Brian, to come down and meet with my team for a full day and explain um, everything web components, from how, to, how do you get into the tooling, how do you start, what does that look like, and um, what recommendations he would have for us getting started. So he recommended OpenWC for tooling. Um, we're using tooling from OpenWC. We get standard practices, and team gets comfortable. Um, trying to dive right into to the mono repo that Penn State is using is overwhelming to think about and daunting when you look at their tooling. It's um, nuts. So we started building separately, and then threw down on a mono repo in order to collaborate with our logo and our branding bar and a couple of other things um, that we're still working on internally. But uh, we, oh, oh, yeah. So this is really exciting. Um, and I only put this up here because this came in literally, if you see this, this was yesterday. And I was driving up here when I read this. And it, it says that he literally got the brand new bar web component that I built to get up on our test site for our museum, which is here, and so now, if you look, I forgot to add the arrow, but right here, that is, <laughs> shut up, don't laugh at me, I'm short. <laughs> um, that is a web component on our dev site, and it pops up with a modal, because this is what the branding office decided we had to do, so we implemented it, and if you look here, this is just like a series of like, for me, this is a huge win, because I've been working towards this um, for the last probably three months and like getting, like can, going through all of the bureaucracy to convince all of the right people, convince our security office, convince like our dev team, bosses, et cetera. And like now I actually have proof is in the pudding, right? Like I actually can say we have web components and we're starting, like we start small, yeah, but like my God, this is going to get deployed on seven sites next week, and then another seven the week following. And I, like, my stoke level is so high, I can't even tell you. So, what's next? Um, we did a usability report where we had three of our people go in completely blind with no guidance at all whatsoever, and um, were asked to complete a series of tasks. And then um, we videoed them doing it, and from there we took, we took out um, everything, we tried to take out everything that, like, all of their feedback, and put it into like one functioning document that then turned into a list of issues that we could solve and what our proposed solutions were, which we'll populate um, the hacks issue queue for 
the lovely Penn State team. Um, so, when I ask what's next, it means let's move on to other things. <laughs> Thank you, Becca. All right, so um, what Becca was uh, um, talking through was her um, uh, going through the, the, the hacks editor experience. So the hacks editor um, uh, allows you to author web components at scale on your, on your uh, website. So what I want to talk through is a little bit more about um, the actual process of building and deploying these specific web components. So uh, my name is Mike Potter. I work with uh, Chuck and Brian um, at Penn State. I'm with the Office of Digital Learning, it's called. Um, and one of my cool projects is Containers on Demand that you should all check out. So, um, so let's take a look at a real world example. So we have our college website that we've been working on. And we've actually put uh, this together using web components. So we've, we have these web components um, that are logo and our footer and our branding bar. And these are out in the wild, right? So these might be on a bunch of different uh, web properties. And this is a new site that I'm working on, and I'm reusing those web components uh, in this website. So as an example, the logo. We took the time to actually craft what our uh, university logo should be. Um, we gave it some options. So we have the standard one. So we, we're telling all the developers, if you want to use the uh, branded logo, use the Gotham hyphen, hyphen logo. Uh, web component. Um, we support two different options, light mode and dark mode. So if you want to use it on a uh, uh, in dark mode, you can just change an attribute on that tag. So cool, it's documented. Um, that goes out in the wild. But then I just got an email saying, hey, uh, we're actually changing the logo. Um, I hope that's not an issue. It's now going to be a bat. All right. So Think through traditionally what that would mean for if you had hundreds of uh, Drupal sites out in the wild, right? Let's see what the process would be with web components. So we have our, I've highlighted the individual web components. We have our logo, we have a footer, and we have a, uh, a brand header. Uh, if we take a look at the source code of that page, we don't see a logo anywhere, right? We see the footer and we see the uh, header. Both of those elements implement the logo. So that is inside of those web component definitions. But it's the same logo. They, but it, the, both of those point to the same logo. So in theory, I should be able to go to the Gotham hyphen logo project replace the SVG code that makes up the logo. Take a look at the demo, make sure everything's still working fine, dark mode still works. Take a look at the header, make sure that the logo didn't change anything in there. And then I'm going to package those changes um, as uh, up uh, using Git. And I am going to uh, publish those to NPM, and I'll show you in just a moment what that looks like. But once they go out into the wild, any website that was using this logo, once they update all of their web components, we'll just get, that will just pop in there. All right? So you can imagine if I had all my web components hosted on a CDN, all of my websites would change instantly without me having to touch any of those other websites. So that's, that illustrates the um, possibility uh, of migrating to web components. So with some of our tooling, um, what you typically do if you're, if you're authoring lots of web components is uh, you have some tooling that allows you to publish these at scale. So anytime I make a change to logo or science or, or footer, um, as soon as I make that change, the tooling just publishes all, all of those changes um, in their individual NPM packages. Okay? So these are their own, own projects. So they can reference one another. If, if I want to use uh, the, uh, the footer for um, maybe just like a one-off project, I just reference the Gotham footer as a dependency of that project and I get it. 
Now, on the back end, this, these could be different teams managing the web components. So I could have a central marketing team managing uh, the logo and the footer, but me in the, got the, in, in the science uh, college, I could be managing um, that repo. And they all get published out uh, to NPM. So that is how you can solve UI design accessibility. Um, problems. But, you know, uh, progressive decoupling could be much more than that. It could be functionality. All right, so if anybody's familiar with uh, uh, Carson, we're going to do like a little exercise. Okay, and I hope I don't piss anybody off. So, I'm already angry. <laughs> responsive menus, math jacks. Web form. My first module ever. All right, so don't throw anything at me. Are you okay? <laughs> you look pissed. <laughs> okay, so just uh, just bear with me for a second here. Let's see. So I put this site together. Oh, what the. F What does it say? It says you need permission to access. Oh! <laughs> All right, so catch me afterwards and I'll show you the video. <laughs> Let me go to the, just the screenshot. <laughs> Come on. Ah, bummer. Okay. So what I did is I put together a, a vanilla Drupal 7 uh, site. And I went out and pulled some content for introduction to our programming. And um, it needs to have some functionality. It has a glossary. So if you click this button here, a modal would pop up. Um, if you scroll, oh, this sucks without the video. <laughs> um, so if you scroll down a little bit, it had an interactive uh, um, uh, like VS code running in your browser that would allow you to write R code, hit process, and it would um, return with the compiled R code. And then it has this new news feed on the side, which shows you the recent news for um, the topic, in this case, R. All right, so imagine that you're very impressed with that demo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming my So this... There's a ton of functionality packed into that one site, right? This was the only module I had installed, the Web Components module. So every bit of that functionality was abstracted into a, a, a backend service with a, web, with a corresponding Web Component that would be allowed to access that service. All right, so keep in mind that Drupal has historically been in charge of everything. What if that wasn't the case anymore? All right. What if we? Why would? Why should uh, Drupal know about MathJax? All right. It, why should it? Why should it worry about responsive menus? It shouldn't. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the the news feed. How would I architect this? Um, so the news feed could be its own project. In this case, it's just hitting this news.org API. So I have a, a server that's like a little microservice, and I have a, a, a web component called new service. So the web component up here, as soon as it is rendered to the page, it knows exactly how to fetch news from this service that's running here. So whenever I deploy this Drupal site, I'm going to also deploy this little microservice to give my Drupal site functionality. Now, where's the integration with Drupal? Get ready. It's just that. It's that simple. Drupal had no idea what a new service is. So now whenever I'm upgrading Drupal and migrating my content, I don't have to think about that. That's just going to follow it wherever this content goes. So 
Um, that's how web components could also start uh, helping you uh, progressively decouple functionality. So if you hear the differences between monolith and microservices, that's exactly what that pattern could look like. All right, and that's all the time I have. I'm gonna hand it over to my co-worker, Chuck. <coughs> I'm Chuck, uh, I work with Mike, as he said, at the Office of Digital Learning at the Everly College of Science at Penn State. Our team uh, collectively uh, collaborates with uh, Brian's team over at College of Arts and Architecture, and we've been working on hacks, obviously, and web components. Um, my specific role is I've been really focusing on hack CMS theming, so you've heard a lot about hacks. Well, we finally developed enough uh, assets that we could kind of start to build a whole CMS out of it. Um, Mike did a really good job of showcasing uh, Gotham University and some make-believe stuff, uh, but I want to walk you through like a real-life example. So this is a website I've been building uh, for our office, and it's using all web components um, to do so. So I'm just going to see if I can, where am I going here? You and your wacky, uh, you actually have to, there we go. All right, so you can see here, like Mike was talking about, we have logo, we have a page banner. We start to see some of these visual assets on the front page, uh, different card treatments, a news feed. Um, this button down here, a little pop at the top, a uh, place for videos, a little widget, uh, let us select our courses. These are all kind of like common elements you might find on any typical website. So what if we could start making those in individual web components to just reuse and reuse over and over again? Again, we would have flashed down our team page, all web components, you can kind of start to see content. Um, scroll back up here, Some this is like a news feed. It's voice activated. It's voice activated, <laughs> news feed. Um, that ties with the, uh, the, the authors to the actual news feed. It's the same tag that I'm using in all the feeds. They're just uh, calling, querying different information. So again, we have some courses. You see some of the common elements, page banner, another feed, um, just buttons, just real simple elements that we can use to start like making our, our library or collection of uh, assets, if you will, to start building these things. So let's look at an actual like page, all right? So let's see some of the guts. This is, you got the page uh, banner. We have some service icons, um, service banner with like an image and a video. All those service banners are the same uh, web component. Let's look at the, inspect the page banner first. You can kind of start to see the guts, right? So we have the page banner tag, um, different uh, properties, image, text, field, all uh, for accessibility needs. Um, if you go ahead and right in here, we click in, you can get into the Shadow DOM. All the components are, uh, they have their own CSS, their own HTML, and their own logic inside of them, baked inside. So that's how you kind of start to see that. Um, and the DOM's nice because it prevents bleed over from, you know, one element maybe interfering with the CSS of another element. Um, we keep looking at things. These are my service uh, icons. You can just see there's multiple of them on the page. So there's the same tag. I'm just reusing them over and over. Um, same thing, shadow root, where the style lives, uh, the HTML um, of the element itself. When we come down a little bit further, I'm going to show you the service banner. This one's a little bit more, uh, it's got a little more functionality into it. So it, it hosts um, a video. It can be a type video, a type image, or a type icon. It gives you a source. Um, there's an option to align left or right, so you can alternate down the page. Um, there's also a URL. Um, tag, which I'll get to here in a little bit. I'm a little ahead of myself, but yeah, it's just using the same element to creatively kind of like uh, mix it up a little bit. So there's the URL. Um, if there's no URL property, the read more doesn't show up. When you start talking about buttons and assets like that, it's nice because you can start to bake accessibility like ARIA labels and stuff into your buttons, and you don't ever have to worry about it. Once it's in there, you just keep using it over and over again. Um, and then we have some of those uh, testimonials, which I'm going to go a little bit further with. So if we look at the personal testimonial tag, which was the one at the very bottom there, which had like an image and a little quote, um, you can see that this is just what it looks like, right? So you have different properties, accent, image, name, and position, and you can fill that in. Uh, there's a slot, so anything that falls in between the two tags will show up. Uh, it's like part of the content. Um, to get those properties, right, so we need to, how, how would you do that? 
Um, so we, in the code, we do a static get properties return and start listing them out. Um, you can see elevation, image, name, position, and then those all take like a type. You could have strings, booleans, any sort of value like that. Um, a value, reflect the attribute if you want it to show up in the DOM. Um, so that's how we get there. And then once you have your properties defined, like what's that look like in the HTML? Um, you can see the double bracketed data binding for image up there in Iron Image. So it's tied, that property is tied to the source attribute of Iron Image. So anytime that you give the source like a, an image and it's a string and you tie it to that source, that's where it's going to pull that I image from and you're going to get that image. Um, the big thing here in all this is, you know, we're making these tags and I make these design assets, but I don't want to keep making them over and over again. I want people to be able to use them in different places. So here's an example of it on uh, hacks.camp. We used it. Um, here's an example of it. I did it in a Drupal 7 site, much like uh, Mike was showing. Um, the web components module, you can get that at uh, uh, drupal.org backslash projects backslash web components. Um, <laughs> so, uh, basically that's all, I mean, you go in and there's a nice readme file in that module, so when you download that module, it's going to tell you like step-by-step -step instructions on how to get it working. You basically have to, you, all you need is uh, libraries and an entity, mo entity module, and then once you have those in, um, there's like a step-by-step, -step, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll make a new directory for web components in the libraries directory and run a couple scripts, but then it lets your Drupal site know, like, hey, I'm ready for web components, and you can slam them into the body field, you can put them into your TPL files. Um, I kind of recommend everybody, it seems like it, it gets kind of daunting. I, I've had my best success by picking like a small design element on a website, like an image or a button or a banner or something, and starting with that, uh, much like uh, Becca did with the government site. You know, they just, they're starting with the top bar. It's not a heavy lift right out of the gate, but it gets them, gets them rolling. So that's what we've been trying to do. And that's been my focus mostly, is just creating these assets that we can reuse across multiple sites. So, and at the top of that one asset, you saw an NPM install. So this is how the JavaScript world is going to eat all of our events. <laughs> We're not keeping pace with them. So these bricks are all available on NPM. Um, and we have way more than just that one that, that Chuck's made or the hacks. Frank, <laughs> The hacks tag, so here's another one. It's a basic figure label. <clears throat> if you want our figure label, which then has the semantically cited aspects of what is supposed to be in a figure tag, then you can now get that at this address. Or if you wanted, Mike, Mike talked about math before, right? There is a math jet, he did this, I think it was like two years ago. There's a math jacks module for like every platform out there. So everybody's always Googling math jacks plus Drupal or WordPress or whatever. When it's just a little snippet of JavaScript, it has literally nothing to do with the platform. So we've made it platform agnostic, in effect. So if you, if you get our tag and then you use LRN hyphen math, now you can have math jacks in any platform. Or if you want to, uh, we, it's, you know, not just our tags, there's a lots of other companies and development teams implementing and deploying elements. And so Vadin is a, is a really good source of them. Um, they have this awesome upload widget that gives you drag and drop upload capability, support for multi-file uploads, all that stuff on the front end without getting pluplload, the right version of jQuery, the right tiny MCE plugin to talk to Drupal 7, crap, we moved to Drupal 8 and they didn't upgrade that other thing over there. Right, you get out of that, you can detangle that dependency hell that we've all been in. Uh, so, uh, or you can get even crazier. This is um, our code editor tag. If this looks familiar to anyone, it's because it's actually running VS Code in the browser. So if you want the same editing experience for people on a website, if you've ever gone to like Stack Blitz or anything like that, and you see something that feels like the VS Code editor, it's because it literally is the VS Code editor. It's a JavaScript library. Um, we also, this is, uh, one of the more impressive elements Nikki's been working on, it's an editable table. So it was mentioned accessibility by Ray in the last, the last session about like having people put tables in the page. We're having people edit tables this way. So imagine a tag that's able to pick up and abstract a table tag and then correctly give you feedback and make it accessible, right? So instead of writing TRTD whatever or having a complex backend render out a table, you can just click a few buttons and basically build rows out the way people do in Excel. It's a tag. Um, or headless forms. Um, so our system, HackCMS, actually serves up a schema, and then we have a single tag that can take that schema and generate forms. 
No more TPL files. No more hey, go add that field. This is actually a form headlessly built out of other web components. So I can use other web components as the input type for other web components. It, this stuff gets trippy really fast. Because then you get up to the HAX tag, which has a whole conference now. We're going to have four this year at least, and we'll gladly host them anywhere else. This tag is so stinking complicated that it's really hard to do in a single talk. But if you go to hackstheweb.org, you can play with this. Every aspect of this platform is open source. We have over 400 web components that are out there open source, 207 NPM repositories, all of which will work in any platform. Our tooling is open source, all the stuff that might, we actually used to do talks just about tooling, all of our tooling is open source as well. So uh, this is the tag with the jersey and the people at the front. And Hacks understands web components. This is why it's a game changer. So if you don't like our video player tag, I, I think you're nuts because our video player tag is incredible. Um, but Hacks knows how to read that video player tag because the video player told Hacks. It's an inverse relationship of what's going on with the Gutenberg, Gutenblocks editing interface. Gutenberg has to be told what is it can edit. It has to be given the rules of the road and you have to make these brand new things that only work for Gutenberg. Hacks is able to read off of metadata inside of your design assets and then generates an interface via that headless forms tag so that you can just edit it in place. So if you go to hackstheweb.org, you can actually play with the editor itself. But if you don't like hacks and you know someone's doing a UX and audit on it right now to keep improving it, um, you just want the video player, just get it. All of those different repos are not requiring hacks or vice versa. So, and this is the video player, by the way. So if you want uh, an incredibly accessible, ultra-performant way of displaying YouTube videos that have searchable transcripts, you can go and run npm install lrn web component slash video player. Um, the transcripts scroll with you as the video is playing. If you click in the transcript, it jumps to the point in the video. This is a whole company's thing that was sold to us in higher education that we basically never have to spend money on again because we have this. If you scroll past it on the page, it will automatically stick it to the top like a CNN video player would, and it works in any platform. I'm no longer wed to Able Player, which is what I was using, that was then a Drupal 7 module integration tied to a specific version of jQuery, and now I'm, I, I can't can't upgrade. So these little pieces of functionality at a time, we can widow down what our existing systems are. We've actually disabled 60 modules in Elm's Learning Network as a result of this. So all those little tiny decision trees keep adding up. So um, while I'm paid, and actually three people in the front of this room are effectively paid to keep Elm's Learning Network running, I have written all of about 50 lines of code for it in the last year. I don't write code for Elms anymore. It's like my baby, it's what I've worked on forever, but every other piece of effort that I do benefits the web as a whole, and that makes Elms more powerful. So while we primarily write the hacks editor to work with Elms, it's not the only thing that has it anymore. So Grav CMS, you can also get the hacks editor for. Drupal, you can get the hacks editor for. Um, whether that's Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Drupal 6, or Backdrop. And it's because Hacks is pushing so much functionality to the front end that the back end is really just save an HTML blob. How many people are setting up paragraph tags to organize and structure bands of content that really aren't about data modeling and are more about how am I going to sell someone on the UX of inputting all this information? So if we can get enough UX uh, effort into Hacks, we can take on something else you might know from another island that is trying to get into this island. Does anyone use Gutenberg in Drupal? Thank goodness no one raised it. Let the record reflect, no one raised their hand. Because <laughs> I, I'm saving you five years from now because the output of that is garbage. It's a whole bunch of commented out code that goes into the body field that has WP hyphen Drupal hyphen block hyphen blah, 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 a mile long. You're gonna be stuck on that forever. So, and, <laughs> I mean, we want to save that island. So uh, there's a hacks editor plugin for WordPress that I'm currently trying to get accepted into the store. But wouldn't you know, when a company controls the flow of information in that store, it's hard to get a competing editor when they just put three years of R&D into it. <laughs> Very strange. So anyway, let's look at a DX comparison between these two. So if I need to write a new Gutenblock plugin, which is their name of like getting a thing, a piece into that editor, I need to learn React. 
um, which is a specific library framework. I'm not knocking it right here. I'll probably have a slide later where I knock it. Um, so <laughs> then I have to design my asset, integrate it with JavaScript. Then I need to learn Gutenbergisms. Then I need to learn PHP, the WordPress API, and how it interfaces with Gutenblocks. Then I'm locked into WordPress. Or if you get it for Drupal, it works in Drupal. Contrast that with what we're doing with hacks. You learn web components, which yes, you do need to learn a library or framework, but web components can be made vanilla. They are a standard of the browser itself. Okay, React changes every year. It might be in subtle ways, but you're dictated to by Facebook and a handful of people that control the destiny of that project versus a web standard that is never going away. A paragraph tag from 1980 still works today. Imagine you made a tag that works forever, that has a very specific use case that you never have to think about again. That's what we're getting with web components. So then to integrate that with hacks, all that that component does is implements a static get hacks properties, which we have stuff that automates the writing of hacks property schema, but it's a little JSON blob that basically just says like, there's a title field and the title field maps to the thing title. There's in the video player, there's one that says, there's a source field and source maps to SRC and present it as a text input or an upload field. So um, these assets will work with or without hacks. I never wanna waste effort on anything platform specific ever again, even my own stuff. So if for whatever reason I decide to stop using hacks, which is not gonna happen, but if I did or I had a site that doesn't need hacks, I can still use all that design library knowledge. That's not locked away in WordPressisms or Drupalisms anymore. So what we're talking about is sustainability of web content, by my definition at least. So React libraries and frameworks in general are going to always require build routines and they will always have to be changed. You will always be trying to catch the tail of front end development's learning curve. It's always moving forward. However, and that's, you know, the content stored is HTML blobs. But because we're adopting a web standard that is the platform itself, right? No one questions if CSS attributes are going away once they're there, right? We've had very few exceptions in the web standard in general of tags being deprecated. Blink is literally like the only one <laughs> because a bunch of Netscape engineers got drunk and then made a Blink tag. But so like these things are gonna live forever and lit element, which is what we build a lot of stuff on, it's what we advocate in the open-wc.org uh, tooling, um, it's, it's like 6K. It's incredibly small, and this is a good deprogramming PHP versus JavaScript uh, blog post articles. If you see people talk about bloat in JavaScript communities, at times they're arguing between like 20K and 10K. I don't ever even consider that in like a Drupal site page load as far as how much JavaScript I'm shipping historically, so I just laugh at those people, and then I gladly implement their 6K library that saves me a ton of time and headaches. So, as Chuck mentioned, um, we actually are building our own content management system now. And the reason we're able to do that is because if you start using hacks and you think about what that's replacing in a traditional CMS, a backend for that is basically just storing HTML blobs that we can expand infinitely. So um, if you go to github.com slash mzln slash hackcms, we just released version one this week. Um, it started out as an experiment over a year ago and it's quickly morphed into something we use to power um, online courses, uh, blogs, uh, the hacks.camp website is written in it, wcfactory.js.org is written in it, um, but you're presented with a login prompt, and then I'm able to manage my microsite universe, basically. Because what we're doing with it, it's a static site generator. Everything you do is writing to a static file format every time. You're calling up the hacks editor in context, so I click edit on any page, Hacks becomes available, I make my changes, I hit save. Hacks takes the page, turns it into HTML, which it already was, it's just HTML, ships it to the back end, stores it in pages slash name of the page slash index.html. That is a forever format. That page will never stop working. And I can confidently say it will never stop working as long as I can always ship a web standard API to it. So if I can teach the page that this is a meme hyphen maker tag, which is what it is, that will work forever. So, hack CMS versus the world, including this world here that I came from. 
So it's a what I'm calling an organic static site generator. If you go to hacktheweb.org, we're actually tricking the static site aspect into faking a JSON web token to make the editor appear. If you go to like btlpro.com, you could actually mess with some variables to get it to think that it has a backend, and then the hacks editing interface will emerge. So we have purely static assets living on GitHub that if they detect a backend via an API call, they go, oh, you, you're authorized to use this because you must have logged in at some point, and now you can modify the files. Those files are incredibly easy to ship around and publish. I can take those files, zip them up, send them to you. You can open them um, because we're working on all this in a platform agnostic way. Right? I didn't even mention it. We're working on desktop app as well. So our CMS will be a fully native desktop app via Electron, which is able to render web pages and has is running on Chrome, which naturally works with web components. So um, we're also uh, simultaneously working on a PHP and to Ray's point about what does the future hold and threat mitigation, um, Hack CMS will be able to have PHP and Node.js based backends because just because your hosting company, particularly in a shared hosting environment, doesn't support Node.js, you still exist and belong and should have your voice published on the internet. So um, it has an, I'm working on, it's an API for system and so the site will work whether you have Node.js behind it or whether it's static or whether it's PHP. It's about permanence and this stuff working forever. Chuck didn't get into theme design, but the theme that he was illustrating in that, which is a hack CMS site, is also built out of web components. So if you learn how to make web components, everything we're talking about is something that you can jump in and understand what's going on. You can start with a single brick like Nara did, like we did three years ago, and all those bricks still exist. We, we stopped thinking about that endpoint integration for the NARA logo because that brick is gonna work the same way forever and it's scoped away from everything else on the page. So with that, uh, I'll leave you some links. If you have any questions, um, I highly recommend going to open-wc.org. Um, it's, it's a community website, it's not affiliated with us, but we do participate in discussions, use some of their tools. Um, they're very, very welcoming community. Um, Lit Element, uh, is the base class that we use for a lot of things. Um, I'd also check out pika.dev. If you're coming from like a React worldview or Angular worldview, um, the manifesto that Pika is preaching is unbundling and not having build steps. So it's really something important to pay attention to if we're trying to stay ahead of what's, what's coming to gobble us. And then hackstheweb.org, and I should have put hacks.camp um, for more information on all things hacks and all of our, our projects. So with that, if anybody has any Questions? Yeah? How does dependency management work if you're using a third party developed uh, web component? Uh, are there security considerations or you know, we'll just keep updating and so that's so the question was say the question for the recording. So the question was how does dependency management work with like externally hosted assets? So when you're using NPM and I write let's say it's Vadin, right? Because I didn't I didn't develop the Vadin upload tag. I type npm, or we use yarn, I type npm install uh, vadin hyphen vadin upload. That actually grabs a copy of that in time, writes a package file that tells me, hey, this is version X, and then installs it locally. So you're never, like, when, and, and that does get a little confusing, because part of where the huge gains come from is just the, the uh, transparency, right? So if it's Mike's making his Gotham tag, if he pushes it, if he makes it, he pushes it out to the repo, that doesn't influence the rest of the universe. And that is something that we end up stumbling over a little bit as far as like getting started in this. But we know now that we have the new definition for Gotham hyphen whatever. So when we decide to push that code up to a static location that we control, right? Like I, I don't recommend using just some public CDN that's the Wild West, um, then that will get updated. Does that make, does yeah. that clarify? Managers who are used to editing rich text, um, is the expectation that they get more comfortable with writing the tags and use team level? So, um, we can't, so the hacks editor is writing the tags. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, so the question was, um, is the expectation that content contributors are going to be writing these new tags, like in a CK editor type environment type of thing? Um, so we, that is possible. Um, it's also possible um, if you've used like the templates 
button or like the CK editor template module, those types of things to extend it. To imagine, like the whole point of that is to give someone a blueprint to stamp out and then, you know, a little icon, right? So that they can kind of cheat on what the HTML that's being written. So if you imagine taking that and the thing that's being written is actually a web component that, that a developer has had control over, um, that was actually part of why, what led to hacks in the first place. We made these to solve our own problem with these little design assets. And then we had a couple of them that started to get big enough where some of our staff members were like, well, I want to use that, I like that. I like that. How do I get that to be over here? We're like, oh, just copy and paste this HTML, which then is still like, it's okay, so either you use bracket goofy tokens or you use actual HTML tags. So there's still room for error there, which is why then we move forward to hacks. But yeah, for, for CK Editor and TinyMC, you can absolutely just pop open view source and do that. You could also bury them in like Twig templates or TPL files to just have them render out that way. Recommendations about like if you wanted to just start in Drupal, like module install, is there a theme to descend from to make this stuff more readily available in the Drupal universe? So, the question is uh, what module do you get to get started with web components in general, you mean? Yeah. Okay, so with web components in general, there's a Drupal 7 version of the web components module. There isn't one for Drupal 8 because honestly all the module's doing is, like Chuck said, you make a sites, or a, uh, sites All Libraries folder and then you put your assets in Web Components directory. But you're probably running a build routine and having to learn some of this tooling stuff anyway. So we felt like, what's the point of having this as a Drupal 8 module when ultimately you're gonna have to do that work and then you would probably put in your theme layer is actually what makes a, a lot more sense to most people. Um, that's where the script type equals module aspect. That's literally what the Web Components module is doing, is it's yeah. just crafting that little bit and then stuffing it in page footer. <laughs> okay. so, so when we moved to D8, it was like, I don't really, this isn't really doing much. Now the hacks module in Drupal 8 actually does do that. Right. Um, so you can get the hacks module for Drupal 7 or 8. And in 8, it just wires up support for that. Um, the hacks module for Drupal 8 is also a zero config install because it will hit one of our CDNs. There's a couple CDNs now that host our assets. But to your point before, like you're then being dictated to by me pushing out new changes because Mike found this cool thing that Nikki fixed and whatever and Becca submitted it, right? So like it's more important that that's mostly like a play with it, yeah. see if this is what you want to do, and then you actually go and say, well, I actually only want these three assets. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and we're at time. So we're going to the after after party. If you have any questions, feel free to stop us. Uh, we also got hackswip.org to do scavenger hunts. You can win these babies. But thank you.